Hi, everybody. This is Patrick Heffernan at Technology Business Research. We're going to start the webinar in just about a minute to allow folks to get their cup of coffee and settle down and settle in. So hang tight. We'll be back in just one minute to start. Okay, everybody, hello. Welcome to the TBR webinar series. Today, my colleagues, Kelly Lashiska and John Kroll and myself will be talking about management consulting and innovation and transformation centers. So before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. Bottom of your screens, there's a series of buttons. Left to right, you can access the slides, audio controls, Q&A, speaker bios, a survey, information on the next webinar in the series, uh, including a registration link, there's something new, there's a new free trial offer, so look at that, um, and then related content that you can download um, the slide deck from this and, and access some other material. Um, and the buttons on the bottom also allow you to minimize each window, customize it the way you want it for this, for this webinar, um, maximize the slides, make them full screen. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a replay link, uh, as well as a link to view and register other webinars. And I speak really fast, so you may want to use that, that replay link. Um, if you do have any questions, please submit them on the, um, the Q&A widget in the ON24 platform. And you can, of course, reach out to us uh, after this event at webinars at tbri.com. Uh, okay, and so thank you. Let's get rolling. Um, so I mentioned my colleagues, Kelly and John, and I want to give them a, a full introduction, especially for people who are joining today who are not familiar with TBR. Uh, Kelly leads our coverage kind of an eclectic assortment of management consultancies and, and IT services vendors. That includes EY, PwC, BCG, Fujitsu, uh, and HDL. And she's also our lead analyst for the management consulting benchmark that we're going to spend a lot of time on today. John Kroll covers TCS and Tech Mahindra. He, he also has a supporting role on Infosys, KPMG, IBM, a handful of, of other vendors. Um, and John is also taking on the lead for our research around sustainability uh, as we go into the second half of, of 2021. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And I mentioned the vendors that they cover because it's important to understand uh, that we at TBR come to this market looking at individual vendors and we build our understanding of trends and expectations based on what we're seeing at the vendor level. So you will hear plenty of vendor specific examples uh, and if you have questions, again, feel free to drop them into the, the Q&A or, or reach out afterwards. So what are we going to cover? We're going to begin with a focus on the centers, the Innovation and Transformation Centers. Then we're going to expand that to talk about how trends, what's happening in these places, are going to impact management consulting. And then we'll fi finish with some larger management consulting trends uh, from our just-published uh, benchmark. Uh, and then, of course, we'll leave time at the end for some, some Q&A. But... Before we get to that, we need to do a quick poll. And that's sort of the title of this uh, webinar, and we definitely are going to get to this question as we're going along really throughout the entire webinar. And that's, does innovation require being in person? Um, yes, no, depends on the intent uh, or the business problem, or it's impossible to answer. And I think one of the challenges here is innovation is, is almost like the term digital transformation. It's used for so many different things by so many different people. Um, but you also know what it is when you see it, when you feel it, when you're involved in it. Um, and I think that in-person component of innovation is something that, while we all might have appreciated before the pandemic, we certainly understand it um, even better now. And obviously, I'm sort of giving you my own answer uh, to what that question might be. But let's see what um, what are the results from the polling. And, and it's overwhelming. Uh, it depends on the intent of the business problem. And I think that's, um, I think that's 100% true, uh, but I'm still going to lean towards yeah, you got to be in person, um, even if you're trying to do something remote. Every All the experience that we've had over the last year and a half um, has shown us how much can be done remotely. Um, but I think we're going to argue over the course of this, this next hour that a lot of it has to happen in person as well. So let's move on now and talk about these innovation and transformation centers. And, and what are we talking about when we say that? You can see here our definition, and I'm going to explain some of the 
taxonomy on the next slide, but I want to be very clear about a few things. Um, we know that these centers are all different in their own special ways, but we do see enough commonalities to look at key characteristics and what really drives success. Um, we know these centers are designed with different measures of success in mind, um, but again, we see enough of the commonalities to kind of analyze their impacts across the vendors themselves, the consultancies and IT services vendors who run them, and then of course their clients. Um, and then, and this part is really critical to how we think about these places, they're constantly evolving. So our taxonomy and our analysis, um, and even honestly, even the centers that we consider worth considering and being part of this market landscape, that continue, continues to evolve as well. Um, and I'll also add this, between, I, I want to say 2015, it might have been a little earlier, but sometime around 2015 and, and early 2020, um, we had visited over 30 of these centers, pretty much everywhere in the world except maybe Australia and Africa. We got you know to every other continent. Um, a fair amount of our analysis and what we think about uh, these centers and how we reflect on what are the trends and what's happening there um, is related not only to those experiences of being physically on site, um, but also talking to the people who are there and keeping touch with them, you know, from 2015 through, you know, early 2020. And of course, during the pandemic, um, we had a lot of opportunity to have discussions with people who are at these centers still and delivering, delivering remotely. So let me talk a little bit about taxonomy now. Here's the list um, that we use in our market landscape on these places. And also some examples, these are not, this is not a, a, a an exhaustive list um, of these kind of places, um, but you'd probably be familiar with uh, at least one or many of these different vendors and what they're doing there. Um, so two points on taxonomy, and I wanna, I wanna highlight these two points because we're gonna talk about them in some depth as we go along. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about something that we still struggle with. Staffing operations and location and footprint often cause confusion because the differences between centers can be so wildly so stark, so wildly different, um, especially when it comes to, you know, the staffing part and it comes to the footprint part. Um, but really what matters, what we found, what is critical, isn't isn't the breadth, like how many centers you have and how many places the location, and it's not the scale, it's not how many people you have, it really truly is the intent. Um, so, for example, so truly innovation centers that are intended to catalyze their clients towards business model changes they need dedicated people, not a skeleton crew. But a, a showcase that's primarily intended to inform clients about the full breadth of a consultancy's capabilities, and really importantly, that consultancy's comfort level with emerging technologies, that can be more lightly staffed. And for us, that still fits within the idea of an innovation and transformation center. So what matters is what the center is intended to do. That's more important than any sort of raw numbers or locations. Um, and I want to touch on measures of success because um, that's been a holy grail for us uh, and for many of the people that we talk to at these centers. When you get beyond the basics, how many engagements per year or how many engagements per quarter, you know, how many clients come through, um, what is the, you know, the track revenue back to a particular engage. When you get beyond that and those sort of relatively easy things to measure, most people running these places will admit that the value comes from something more, but that's something that's very hard to define and very hard to measure. So we're sort of always on the lookout for examples of success that separate any one center or any one consultancy or IT services vendor from the rest of the pack because what they were able to do that was differently successful and measured differently uh, than others. So where are we now? Uh, as we go into this sort of post-pandemic world uh, that we're all hopefully living in, um, one way to look at, you know, where are we now is, is look at what did the most, I want to say aggressive, but really I mean the most successful dynamic consultancies and IT services vendor, what did they do during the pandemic to position themselves for where we are right now? So the pandemic forced every vendor to deliver engagements virtually. Uh, and eventually then in, in a hybrid format. Um, and what I think is important, the, the leading vendors really constantly refined their approaches to delivery. They were taking in feedback from their clients, 
from the center's teams, from others. Uh, most most of the vendors that we spoke with and, and heard fine feedback on um, very quickly pivoted away from simply replicating virtually every aspect of an in-person session. Folks realized right away that doesn't work. Um, but the real leading vendors invested in understanding, refining, relearning what worked virtually, what worked in a hybrid format, and then what simply needed to be set aside for return to in-person engagements. There were consultancies that were willing to tell their clients, we're not going down that road with you now because it's not going to work. We need to be in person. We need to wait until we can do that. And to me, that appreciation for the need to constantly refine the process and constantly refine the way that eng engagements were delivered really set apart some of the, the consultancies and the IT services vendors that we've, we've been looking at. Um, and many of the discussions we had during the pandemic sort of centered on what was still possible, but the really interesting, the innovative discussions got into what's now possible because of what had been learned during the pandemic and all the, the forced all virtual sessions. So a second key finding for us was that the, the leading vendors kept the doors open uh, when everything else closed. They understood the need to keep creative staff fully engaged and that clients could still derive value from the virtual sessions, again, that they were constantly refining. Um, and those leading vendors really kept up the pre-pandemic pace of innovation and transformation engagements, and they stayed committed to their physical investments in these centers. I'm not saying you know, that we talked to consultancies that broke COVID restrictions and brought people out into anything like that, um, but they made what was critical is they made clear to their own people and to their clients that these centers would continue to operate. So that, that uh, mid-2020, where we're saying the world was upside down, a lot of the leading vendors said, yeah, the world might be upside down right now, but it's coming back to this and we're going to continue to invest in these people. Um, and so, again, you know, like I mentioned before, the title of this webinar is Innovation Requires in Person. We, we do believe that. And, and again, we'll get to why. Um, but during the pandemic, some of the consultancies and IT services vendors made very, IT services vendors made very clear these physical centers still mattered and the people staffing them, running the sessions, providing their expertise, all of that would continue to be valued even in a virtual world. Um, you can probably tell at this point that this is a, a topic I get pretty passionate about. Uh, I could probably go off on another uh, 10 different things that we learned um, during the pandemic about these centers, but we'll, we'll go on. Um, I do want to bring up um, one aspect that's been really kind of profoundly shaped by whatever, at what every vendor did um, during the pandemic, and that's been – more internal subject matter experts attending innovation and transformation center engagements that bring extra value to the client. Pretty much every vendor took advantage of all remote working, so no flights, no delays, no commutes, no jet lag, as a way to introduce more of their own professionals to the centers, both to the centers as a staff, as a group of people, but also to the engagements that were going on. Um, no question that really helped with clients, um, and that sort of flying in the, the, the you know, the, the SME video conferencing in, that's no longer a compromise in quality, but it's a boost because the clients know that's truly the best SME that the consultancy has to offer. So that's going to continue. But here's the, the wicked important part. Selling the value of these centers internally became a higher priority for those leading vendors already anticipating a return to in-person engagements. And how do you sell value internally of these centers? One way is to have professionals seeing the very best of their firm brought to their clients, influencing their engagements, making a difference in how they're delivering to their clients that they own. Um, these SMEs bolstered internal support for the value of the centers simply by being able to deploy more easily in this kind of all remote world. We spend a ton of time at these centers talking to people who run them, and we appreciate that it's a constant battle to justify the costs, explain the value, balance helping key, key accounts, strategic accounts, with helping every account that wants help. All, all those internal challenges. So, again, during the pandemic, the really leading vendors found a way to not only make themselves more valuable by bringing in SMEs, by changing, by, by refining their delivery every single time. Um, but I think we're going to see the spillover effects of that 
coming as as these vendors sort of take advantage of the things that they've learned and take advantage of, of what can be possible now uh, in this post-pandemic world. So what comes next? We think, again, this is an area, laughing at myself, it's an area I could go off on uh, for, for, for a full hour. Um, centers are going to become more industry focused in the in the near future, and they're going to embody everything that a vendor does. So when I say industry focused, I mean expertise and offerings that are tuned to a specific industry or intentionally located in an industry and a client cluster. Um, we've started to see some in 2021. We're going to see a lot more than we think in 2022. Consultancies and IT services vendors are looking to combine a long-standing strength around industry expertise with a trend towards industry clouds and clients that are looking for an industry-specific immersive experience. What does all that mean? So consider a innovation transportation, uh, innovation transformation center located at Logan Airport in Boston, Mass. Getting to the center will remind the client of the challenges of actually traveling to an airport. So if the client is, is the airline, it allows that client, even before they've gotten to the center, to start thinking about how soon in this customer journey can I get in touch with the client? How, how soon can the airline become part of their getting to the airport? If the client is a municipality, they as they're driving to Logan Airport, they can be thinking about all the different ways they can get public-private cooperation to happen to make that, that journey easier. In the airport itself, you know, a retail client walks through the terminal and sees all those, those, re all those shops. I mean, airport terminals are basically malls now. So uh, a client that, that has supply chain challenges is going to see how supply chain challenges are tackled within an airport, media and advertising. All of this is, is about being immersed in the physical environment, and multiple kinds of clients can have multiple kinds of unique experiences, all, all tied to physically being in the airport, but also – and the challenges and the, the um, innovations and opportunities there, but also going beyond the airport. So we have a, um, a special report coming out as soon as I can finish it uh, on a sports arena in Amsterdam that is my current favorite example of how innovation an innovation and transformation center located on an industry site can be, can be absolutely game-changing. Um, and another point that we call out, I do want to mention sort of what comes next and is – and this is in our, our market landscape that on these centers, it comes out twice a year. Um, so the most recent one, we did note that, that the client's needs to accelerate digital transformation um, and then and stay focused on that will lead consultancies, again, this is what we're seeing, the trend that we think is coming, um, to bring their clients through the centers repeatedly, addressing the same business problem and using the centers at every stage from design through piloting, through scaling, uh, we think the centers are going to, many of them are going to evolve from focusing mainly on business development and co-creation to really being an integral part of the vendor's delivery solution. Now that, again, that sounds like it's it's the kind of change that would turn these centers into, you know, deployment centers or some sort of strange center of excellence. excellence. I think what it really is, it's, it's about the willingness to come back repeatedly to address the same business problem and seeing that as an evolution, a successful evolution of what these centers can do and not a, you didn't solve it for me the first time and now I got to come back. So again, that's in our, our market landscape and you can, you can take a look at that. Um, so let's do another polling question. Uh, now that you've heard my, my little pitch on why there should be innovation and transformation centers uh, at industry specific locations, you can see a lot of these share and commonalities, and and I think we, we've already heard of some in places like this. A train station was mentioned to us uh, recently that uh, sort of a pop-up innovation and transformation center in a in a rail station in Europe. Uh, I mentioned the the arena in Amsterdam. Uh, I think maritime ports. I've I've always been a fan of the the port as a great test bed for innovation for smart cities, figuring out what what's possible within a, a smart city by testing it in the sort of confined but open ecosystem of a, a maritime port. So, um, so I'm curious, and, and yes, I, I will, uh, I'll be folding in the poll results of this uh, into that special report about um, the arena in Amsterdam. So with that, let's look at the results. And did I go too fast and nobody was able to respond? Possibly. Um, and sometimes the polling doesn't work. That's one of the downsides to um, – this platform, but that's okay. I think I'm going to go ahead and say that the overwhelming response was it's going to be uh, at an arena. So 
that's the way it goes sometimes with technology. All right, what does all this mean? What does all this mean? What's happening at these centers? What is that? What are the implications for management consulting more broadly? I want to talk, touch on three elements here, talent, business model, and community. So talent. Pre-pandemic, lots of IT services vendors and, and the management consultancies recognized that these kinds of centers could be magnets for, for attracting talent and even retaining talent, and that's even all the more true now. The challenge is going to be the – will be staffing, will be – if engagements carry over from innovation through implementation, what I was talking about a couple slides before, there's going to be a need for a different staffing model at these centers, or at least a different way of thinking about who resides at the centers and who comes and goes more frequently. Um, within the market landscape, we detail Red Hat as a just a wicked creative example of staffing differently. And you can read the whole, there's a whole little case study in there. Um, I can't see consultancy. I know I don't see EY and McKinsey renting WeWork spaces for three months set up pop-up innovation labs, but that may be where we're heading for at least some of the vendors who, the consultancies who don't want to invest in expanding their footprint. Um, it's, it's one of those things, I think the challenge around staffing is going to be one of the most important challenges for running these centers um, going forward. So for the management consultancies, though, they have the talent on hand already. They don't need to go out and find all the people that can do this. They just need to find a new way to get the, let's call them the, the not innovative but consultant talent uh, into the centers in, a, in an efficient manner. Um, business model, the, the client pressure to deliver faster results is pressuring these centers to be better at selling products, selling software as a service, selling de delivery, not just selling innovation. Um, that pressure right there, is going to cause some splintering. Some of the consultancies will intentionally stay in the innovation and strategy space only. Others are going to expand into solutions, products, implementation. The challenge for us at TBR is evaluating these changing business models and comparing them, analyzing them and comparing them meaningfully. Um, for the management consultancies, pivoting to new business models has already started for many. Um, PwC is an excellent example of that. And if, if you're not aware of PwC products, um, definitely something to take a look at or shoot me a note and I can explain it. Um, the slower, the more resistant to change consultancies. And I'm not going to say it's too late because, of course, it isn't, but they're, they're going to face an uphill battle to make that change in their business model. And then finally, community. Um, we've noted a, a real increased interest among the consultancies in positioning their centers as part of a broader ecosystem to include academic institutions. Uh, Atos and Capgemini, to, to call out two vendors, really stand out for being early movers in this area. And what we think is the, the recent emphasis on, on academia and scientific communities in particular may represent an effort to bolster the subject matter expertise of the Innovation and Transformation Center staff. So this gets back to what I was talking about earlier with, with SMEs. Clients are more accustomed now to having access to the vendor's full retinue of SMEs. Um, and they may be inclined to see a vendor's, a consultancy's innovations as, as particularly unique if the vendor, if the consultancy is drawing in and participating in, if it's drawn into and is participating in a larger academic ecosystem. So again, that, that brings us back to the SME part. It also brings us back to kind of the early days of these centers um, when physical location depended in part on being close to specific communities, such as the startup communities, such as um, a certain universities. So for the management consultancies, what does that mean? This trend is just a natural extension of the trends around acquisitions, around alliances with technology partners, around addressing the needs, as I mentioned uh, at the start, around talent, addressing the needs of the demands of younger talent, up-and-coming uh, management consultants, as you were. So with that, I've spoken for far too long. We will now turn to Kelly to take us into the management consulting benchmark. Kelly? Thanks, Patrick. Um, so on this slide, we wanted to give you a quick glimpse at um, the market performance for our tracked management consulting vendors. So looking at their revenue for 2020 and how it will look for 2021. Um, while the revenue did sharply de uh, decelerate in 2020, a lot of the activities that the vendors were engaging with was around uh, run the business 
model or run the business uh, essential business um, engagements as well as uh, just business transformation that kind of, that kind of touched across cloud digital uh, technologies as well as help to improve the cost structures for a lot of the vendors um, <clears throat> so looking to reevaluate what was necessary what was not necessary and kind of helping to um, improve their operations and seeing what was the what made the most sense for them where they should be either moving forward or not moving forward um, and so using that uh, consulting expertise to really help them with strategic business decisions as well as looking more at that operations side and the organizational and change side. Um, there are a few underlying trends and investment areas that I wanted to call out which kind of build up into this revenue uh, trajectory. And the first one um, was around AI-enabled technologies, um, AI services, and analytics. Um, and so vendors are diversifying their portfolios and, and increasing their own value propositions by augmenting their advisory capabilities using the AI technologies and services. So <clears throat> the vendors are integrating the solutions with these services to help um, their clients use their data better um, to create <clears throat> a bit more autonomy within the organizations, which helps them to be more efficient, <clears throat> excuse me, and to kind of um, gain deeper insight to make more strategic business decisions and help them shift their business <clears throat> in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> there are a few examples where I wanted to call out where vendors are kind of using their investments and in innovation around AI. And the first one um, is from Deloitte. Uh, so with Deloitte, they, um, they're looking around AI automation um, and cloud uh, to kind of <clears throat> as some top of mind initiatives for the firm um, and using it to augment that advisory services proposition. Uh, so they partnered with NVIDIA to co-launch a center for AI computing They've also expanded their partnerships with UiPath and Automation Anywhere. Um, Deloitte also launched the Deloitte AI Institute for Government, highlighting their efforts to really connect the public and private services, as well as show the value of AI um, within their management consulting portfolio. Um, a second example is around IBM. Um, IBM Global Business Services, their consulting segment, is expanding its capabilities by using the Salonis software, um, using that um, with their own, with IBM's data and AI, to kind of help them um, <clears throat> see areas of value for clients across different applications um, to help them benchmark performance, as well as deploy AI and automation. A second example is around sustainability. Um, and so sustainability has been increasing in importance um, across clients, priorities across their business investments, um, both internally and externally for clients. We've seen a lot of them um, putting up different targets for either energy consumption reduction um, to help them better um, to be more sustainable, reduce their carbon footprint, and to show, showing their own clients um, their the possibilities um, as well. And now we're seeing it kind of shift towards um, externally for clients. So they're using those technologies and capabilities to establish client use cases around sustainable services, which is helping them to drive revenue and profitability. Um, so as clients are looking to vendors to improve their operations and cost structures, as well as continue to generate clients, they're also pulling in that sustainable piece. So making sure that the technologies that they're using are more sustainable. This is pushing a lot of the vendors to align their own consultants and their sales priorities with um, the ESG environmental, social, and governance initiative. And so it's kind of shaping their investment plans, their innovation, um, and their portfolio expansion. Um, so looking aside from um, internal energy consumption inter for vendors, they're also looking um, to kind of help their clients embrace more sustainable technologies. So um, one example um, is with BCG. They, work, uh, they worked with ENI and Google Cloud um, to launch a sustainable platform that helps modernize supply chain. Um, so they're 
using um, the expertise from its partners in technology to kind of create a more sustainable way to look at um, supply chain, reinvent that um, in a way that's more effective for its clients. Um, Capgemini is also ramping up activities with its clients around um, a sustainable digital workplace. Um, so they're helping to create a more cloud-based work environment um, that will help clients work, their clients' employees work efficiently and safely um, remotely as well as both in the office. Um, Patrick kind of touched on this a bit before, but PwC products, um, one product in particular um, aligns pretty well with the sustainability and the growth around there, and it's their ESG Pulse product. Um, and that product helps um, to create sustainable change across organizations as well as help to reduce organizational risk as well as improve employee engagement. Um, so the product looks at different, it aggregates um, the client's ESG data and provides reports and reporting on it um, to help the client bridge the gap between their organizations so where they may have um, less of an alignment or more of an alignment. So it helps them to identify where they need to respond better and helps them better track improvements. Um, these are just a few examples of sustainable investments, but it's an area that we've seen kind of growing um, among the vendors, uh, particularly as the vendors are creating these use cases and the regulations around sustainability continue to increase. We'll definitely see vendors shifting more into that area. And the third and last trend I wanted to call out was around um, retaining employees um, and the reevaluation of the resource management strategies. Um, so following the pandemic, the health and safety of workers um, kind of shifted a bit um, in the sense of how vendors were ensuring that their employees were safe working from home, but now it's kind of shifted backwards to, to ensure that they're safe um, and they're able to work in the office if they come back. So a lot of the vendors are still reevaluating their strategies as they bring employees back to office. Some countries have not quite um, brought them all back, but they're definitely shifting to see what, um, to create that work-life balance and to limit the digital exhaustion, um, helping, helping their employees stay engaged and helping to control their retention. Um, so one example here is around Capgemini. Um, they established a hybrid work model. So around 50% of their activities are performed from home, but they also have flexible work hours um, and an effective borderless deployment of workers. So um, they're kind of giving their employees the flexibility they need, but ensuring that they're Say if they don't um, run into the digital burnout. So I think that's a good example uh, to call out here in terms of looking at the vendors, really helping them to retain the employees and ensure that they have the engagement um, and they're able to connect and work without running into issues or finding the need to leave the company or pursue other opportunities. Um, with that, I will hand it to John Kroll to go into depth on some of the other business segments. Thanks, Kelly. So, uh, and and I think that a lot a lot of what um, Kelly mentioned there is going to show through when you know tying it back to the innovation centers, um, especially with sustainability. Uh, one one vendor, an IT services vendor, not included in our uh, management consulting benchmark, but uh, TCS actually just uh, unveiled their their um, TCS Pace Port, which is in their, their sort of version of innovation centers um, in, in Amsterdam, that's going to focus on sustainable uh, business innovation. Um, so we may see that sort of show through as we go forward in 2021 with some of these management consulting uh, firms. But let me orient you towards the slide here. Um, so what this graph here, we have um, the, the revenue growth for our benchmark vendors for two half 20 and two half 19. And what you see is uh, management consulting growth really decelerated for the majority of vendors. Um, and growth varied across the landscape depending on sort of the investments that they had been making and their portfolio offerings up to this point. Uh, and, at the, and one thing to point out here is that the vendor groups really didn't move in tandem in, in terms of revenue growth um, because it is important to note that the top six vendors in revenue overall have actually stayed the same over the last six years. And those are uh, Deloitte, PwC, KPMG, EY, McKinsey, and Accenture. So 
Um, I'll use the top three in growth here, Capgemini, Bain, and Deloitte, to sort of explain what, what they're doing differently compared to their vendor group, why they're ahead, um, and also touch on some of the key uh, trends that we highlighted in our uh, management consulting benchmark in, in, in three areas here, acquisitions, service lines, and verticals, um, and how that will play out in 2021. So starting with Capgemini, we saw the strongest growth among benchmark firms, uh, growing nearly 15%, but this is largely organic, uh, inorganic due to the company's acquisition of uh, Altron. And for, for Capgemini, that acquisition, actually this uh, recently led to the establishment of Capgemini Engineering, uh, which is its new uh, business line and brand that merges its, its digital engineering and manufacturing search services with the capabilities it gained from Altron. So overall, for the solution-led vendors, um, you know, uh, Capgemini, Accenture, IBM that we co that we cover in our benchmark, acquisitions have clearly been a favored vehicle for expanding that consulting depth and industry expertise, um, and also innovation capabilities. Accenture, for example, really continues to leverage those acquisitions um, of late, notably in supply chain, HR, organizational transformation areas. Uh, looking to compete with uh, a competitor like De Deloitte. Um, and a nice tidbit from our latest report here on Accenture, Accenture completed over 200 acquisitions since 2013. So they have definitely been um, you know, very acquisitive um, compared to the broader uh, management consultant, consulting landscape. Um, but also another solution led IBM has also sort of picked up their acquisition pace since, since acquiring Red Hat. Um, really looking more on the enterprise software uh, shops, uh, SAP and, and Salesforce. Um, but overall, we're seeing benchmark firms are, are ramping up sort of tuck-in style acquisitions, uh, unlike Capgemini and Accenture that are really uh, looking towards larger and more um, acquisitions. Uh, but in general, firms are trying to get those niche, niche capabilities and diversify their revenue bases into areas like uh, Kelly mentioned, like uh, sustainability. Um, but the solution leads appear to be leaning on it more than more so than others. So I'll, I'll turn to Bain now. Uh, and Bain's revenue growth decelerated, but it was still among the top three uh, overall and the top strategy led vendor. And and contrary to what we're seeing with with uh, the big four and solution led firms, uh, which struggled to grow the, their strategy consulting revenues, um, Bain and, and strategy led peers in general benefited from all the uncertainty and the confusion in the market um, and, and leveraged their, their trusted strategy legacy and, and deep relationships to, to win new engagements and, and, uh, and grow the revenue in that area. But all, all of these strategy led or at least most of these strategy-led vendors are working on sort of building out their tech portfolios and their talent. Uh, for example, BCG's uh, multiple tech practices, uh, digital ventures, and Gamma, and, and leveraging, you know, acquiring and leveraging proprietary software to, to attach their core advisory revenues onto. Um, and while Bain was doing that, one area that we, we really noted, it separated itself from the PAC Discord, at least, in terms of growth. Um, and in, also an area that we highlighted in our, in our report as a, um, a top vertical in terms of overall growth across the vendors uh, was financial services. And so Bain, Bain grew 10% in financial services, really focusing on investments that strengthen its data tools and its, I, its IP. Uh, it made an acquisition of Sutton Place Strategies, um, looking at a deal origination tool and a private equity transaction database. And so data was a big focus for it's sort of a theme that we noticed across other vendors as well. EY working with a financial institution to scale its, its data sharing platform. And so financial institutions are, are constantly facing competition from fintech companies and an evolving technology landscape in general. So the need for strategists with the right tech capabilities, not just on the technologies themselves like blockchain, but also on the data that fuels them is going to, is going to be a differentiator moving forward. And so thirdly, Deloitte here, um, uh, one of the big four, uh, they're the third management consulting firm in terms of revenue, re revenue growth uh, in our latest report. And, and they actually accelerated compared to the last year. Uh, of course, you know, it's making tons of investments 
um, and then partnering around emerging technology. That's been a factor, you know, particularly cloud, cyber, AI. Uh, like Kelly mentioned, launched its, its uh, an, a center for AI computer computing recently. But also Deloitte um, relies on, uh, on its operations consulting strengths around HR, governance, risk, and compliance. And that's an area that uh, makes up over 40% of, of all our vendor benchmarked um, revenue and, and it also outpaced other service lines in terms of growth. So Deloitte being one of the larger vendors in that space, I, I believe they're third um, in overall revenue, that they're in an excellent position to capitalize on that demand and uh, as it's unfolding, um, especially over the last year when it comes to risk. Uh, certainly more than one instance where the global supply chains were really shook up, be it a pandemic, a, a canal blockage, or m multitude of ransomware attacks. Um, we're seeing this continue, risk continuing to be an area where, where Deloitte and the big four are, um, are pursuing aggressively. Uh, and, and we put out a special report on EY's uh, evolving approach to risk, which, which takes on a, a much more holistic view uh, compared to the traditional approaches and, and com compliance-related aspects um, that, will, that can be available, I believe, upon request, at least a, at least a link. Um, but so I think I will take a step back. Those are really the some of the highlights from, from the report and I will hand it back over to Kelly to go over some of the talent and the partnerships um, that she will get into next. Thanks, Joan. <clears throat> so looking at this slide, um, <clears throat> we wanna take a look at what's kind of moving forward um, for vendors and what kind of, <clears throat> how they'll be going moving into 2021. Um, so as we've talked about a bit during the webinar, I'm sure you're able to see a lot of the different shifts in the way that the vendors are now engaging with clients, um, how they're using their innovation centers, um, how they're executing on their business model strategies, um, as well as how they're really accelerating their investment and use of technology. Um, so there are, the vendor, the management consulting vendors have been investing in different technology platforms, um, as you've seen some of the product portfolios. I'm kind of shifting the way that they manage their talent, the types of talent that they have. Um, and in doing so, I think a caution that they've been keeping in mind is around the need to protect their consulting brands and to ensure that they don't diminish the value of their technology, um, I mean, diminish the value of their consulting with the use of technology. Um, so there were a few companies that I think are doing um, a good job at preserving their brands and not using technology to kind of like push it out, um, but their position, they're aligning it well. Um, so the PwC products, which we've talked about a few times, um, PwC is very careful in its positioning of the products. Um, it can use the products as lead-ins to consulting in certain cases. Uh, that's not the intent, but um, it is possible depending on either the analysis or from the products showing different, different ways that the businesses are either using their data or analytics and kind of some of those gaps that can serve as lead-ins to consulting, but the premise around um, everything still remains around solving and working to solve um, the business problem. So I think that's kind of what helps them to stay away from the technology-centric view. Um, <clears throat> another company is EY. They, um, <clears throat> their technology investment, um, their investment plans are working around to develop that talent and expertise, um, but also to build out that partner ecosystem around technology to help them enhance their proposition around it and to help support um, their digital and cloud and AI to work differently with clients. So it's not necessarily replacing <clears throat> their services with technology, but using technology to enhance their, in, enhance their um, engagement with with their clients and so to work better with them and to use those technologies to solve that problem or reach a certain goal. Um, as the pandemic pressures lighten a bit um, and the operational fluctuations from the pandemic tend to um, taper down, uh, vendors are likely going to <clears throat> reinvest in innovation and transformation um, internally. So either focusing around some of the sustainability or focusing on developing some of the industry-centric um, innovation centers Patrick has spoken about. Um, working around those really helps, um, is somewhere that I'm sure we'll see them moving as we go through 2021. 
Um, after a year of risk, and I'll focus more on stability and t focusing on your business measures and kind of helping to create that resiliency and um, continuity with your clients, vendors are likely going to pursue more aggressive innovation efforts that help them move into new um, business areas. Um, we'll also see an increase in innovation around um, these different areas as well as the research, research planning. Um, looking from the opposite side, um, so as opposed to losing value from the technology side, I think BCG, um, they have more of a traditional old school view in the market, which has created a bit of a challenge for them in um, capturing some new talent. I think they're still able to recruit talent as normal, but they don't quite have that the same image, the refreshed um, startup image. So developing that technology view in the market and showing their technology expertise would actually help them work better to sell their um, management consulting expertise, um, as well as more effectively compete against some of the other vendors. Um, while they were able to effectively leverage their um, existing client relationships during 2020, the firm needs to focus on um, building out those higher value technologies in line with its consulting, um, either pursuing a similar approach as EY, where they're kind of working hand in hand, so working with um, its subsidiaries of BCG, um, Digital Ventures, Centennial, or Gamma, working together with those effectively to really showcase the value of both and well the breadth and depth of its technology um, network as well as showing um, its skills around consulting. Um, but just to close out around here, um, as the firms are building out a lot of this expertise um, around the technology, so the analytics, the AI, and a lot, we're seeing more of the digital design as well. The firms are able to pull through those management consulting firms, and I think are those management consulting engagements, and using that, um, the technology, and working with them, they're able to see more insights into those operations, which improves their position to work with their clients around both business problems and to help them create more efficiency across their organization. Um, and with that, I will hand it back to Patrick to go over um, the portfolio, I believe. Excellent, thanks. Yeah, just a few things as we wrap up here. I think it's important to understand that um, this is the, the scope of our management consulting benchmark. And, and you can see the, the vendors, the consultancies that are listed, listed there. This is the broadest, deepest benchmark that TBR produces. Um, that we go into verticals, that we go into uh, geos and service lines, we split it all out. There's a massive amount of metrics that are in this thing. Um, it, it is published twice a year. It just recently came out. It includes a set of vendor profiles that go with it as well. So for not quite all of the vendors, we also go much deeper and look at each one of them individually. And then, of course, within the broader context, the benchmark context of looking at them um, compared to their peers. Uh, I think it's a really – it's an important to understand that this particular benchmark, the reason why you just heard from John and Kelly and, and they spoke for, at such length and in such depth on these vendors is because it's supported by the work that goes into the analysis to, to produce this thing. So um, if you see a vendor that's on here that you don't – know enough about, believe me, we have a, a ton of information on it. Um, and then we've also talked about digital transformation. So this is our digital transformation portfolio. And it, this includes, in contrast to semi-annual, this includes monthly reports that range from analytics and insights to digital marketing services to blockchain and I, IIoT, which we just published last month, um, and what we call voice of the customer, which is us talking to people who have bought digital transformation services from the leading IT services vendors and, and consultancies. Um, and then what we highlight today, of course, is the, the Innovation and Transformation Center's market landscape, um, which we publish semi-annually. Um, and then what we do in between the semi-annual market landscapes is we do special reports um, sort of in, in the in-between months based, based on briefings that we get. Um, and then, of course, someday when we're back in person again, we'll, we'll have those as well. Um, if you have any questions about this portfolio or the managing, management consulting portfolio, what it covers, which vendors, how we cover it, just shoot me a message after the webinar. Um, I do want to address one other, I, one other thing I want to get to, but I want to address one of the questions that did come in, and we still have time, so please send more questions if you want. The question was, let me, let me read it out specifically because it was such a great question. 
What are good career models for consultants based in innovation centers? This makes me so happy because this is something that we talk about at great length with the people that are running these centers and the people who are making the investment decisions to continue to invest in the physical place and the people. So the best career model, there's at the one end, I'll give a spectrum. At the one end, there are the people who are true specialists in being able to do these kinds of engagements, lead the teams at these centers, manage the teams at these centers. These people can be deployed and are deployed globally uh, to build new centers. They have an influence on the entire firm that they belong to. That is a massive investment in, um, in talent and in training, in training not only in, in how you do an, an experience or an engagement, but also how do you lead people with vastly different skills. So that, that particular career model um, is a big investment. And I, to my mind, the best way to do it. At the other end of the spectrum, I think the worst way to do it that we've seen is where it's a temporary assignment, where it's a place for a consultant to be off the road for six months, where it's, hey, go get some experience working at this Innovation Transformation Center and then, then come back to the team. That kind of TDY approach, I think, has very little lasting value within the consulting firm itself. Another kind of minimally better, but I still think a bad approach, is to acquire talent that does these kinds of innovation and transformation engagements well, but then keep that talent at arm's length. That's actually easy to do because of culture because of a desire to say, hey, we acquired this really cool hip brand. Let's, you know, make sure that we keep that brand cachet and bring that brand along. Um, but I think long term, it's unhelpful because long term, you're not taking that talent and making them truly part of your own firm and giving them the culture that you've already spent all that time building up. And you don't, the trust that you built with your client isn't as easily transferable when the clients know that, hey, this is just somebody they acquired. So the answer probably is somewhere in the middle, um, where I think the if if it's not to make true deep specialists, it's probably to make innovation and transformation engagements and expertise much like an industry expertise or a horizontal expertise, and then that expertise then grows as the practice grows. So you know if you're at, at EY and you're an SAP guy um, and you work on retail that sort of defines your expertise and who you are as a consultant. This being able to engage in uh, and deliver innovation and transformation engagements and being able to lead and manage those kind of teams, I think is a, could be something that um, is developed as well. So now you're saying, all right, you, you never answered the question, um, does innovation really require being in person? And if so, why? Well, yes. Um, and it's for all the reasons that we've sort of been going over over the course of this last hour. Um, and especially those impacts that are coming from the innovation and transformation centers themselves, which, and this is critical to remember, these are physical centers. So early on, 2015, 2016 timeframe, 2014, some consultancies believe they could replicate emerging innovation into digital transformation, design thinking, creative, collaborative experiences without the physical investment. They could do it all virtually or do it all with a pop-up center. The line that I love to quote is we were told, we don't need funky chairs. Okay, you don't need funky chairs. Within six months, that changed. That thinking didn't last long. Everyone eventually appreciated that being physically present was critical to creating true collaboration and innovation. So then fast forward to the pandemic, and now the lesson that you could come from 18 months of remote only is that innovation can take place through screens, that clients can expect high quality, engaging experiences, even just virtually. But here's where it falls down. That doesn't satisfy the talent at these centers, the creative and the innovative and the experiential talent that's needed to make these engagements work. These people want to be back in person, at least for the kind of interactive, collaborative, innovative work. And we also know innovation doesn't come from sitting around with the same people noodling over the same problem, coming up with the same solution. If the pandemic showed us the possibility of working, and delivering remotely, it also showed us how much broader and bigger our communities could be. So those bigger virtual communities, we also know they're not a substitute for in-person encounters where trust, new ideas, different thinking, all that comes into play. Plus, then you add the acceleration that's coming from digital transformation. The, the pandemic induced much more rapid adoption of emerging technologies 
particularly cloud. Um, and that's sort of shown the limitations of being all remote. The, the technology works. That isn't the challenge. The technology, the emerging technologies are not the challenge. It's the people that are the problem. And if change management works more smoothly with engaged leadership and in-person transition, then you have to be in person. And the changing business model of management consulting, as, as Kelly and John discussed, that compels consultancies to continue innovating, continue collaborating with clients, continue finding in-person ways to deliver value. And so this is not a perfect answer, and I appreciate that. Um, our thinking really comes from these countless discussions that we've had over the last few months as the post-pandemic world starts taking place and we start seeing the emerging changes at the management consultancies and at the Innovation and Transformation Center. And there's, there's one more thing here. There is an urgency. You can probably hear it in my voice and the passion that I'm talking about this. There's an urgency, and it's something we're hearing from the consultancies and the IT services vendors and from their clients. It's an urgency to take advantage of the changes forced by the pandemic to actually do things differently, to truly transform. But the thing is urgency, you don't typically associate that with long-term relationships, you don't associate it with trust. But long-term relationships, trust, those things are reinforced by being in person. So what we think is that urgency is gonna compel more in-person innovation. Are we right about this? Who knows? Check in with us in December after we have our next uh, management consulting benchmark and our next Innovation and Transformation Center's market landscape. Uh, publish. So we've got just a few minutes left. Um, you can see there's the way to reach out to us. Um, if you have extra questions after this, of course, you can go through the um, Beyond 24 as well. Um, we did have a couple other questions that come in, so we'll, we'll get to them uh, really quick. Um, one of them is, what is the right number of people to have staffing an innovation center, and do those people have to be there all the time. So this is a little, I answered this a little bit with the last question. Um, and I think it's also something I said at the very beginning where sort of location and footprint and staffing and operations are all subject to what you are trying to do with your center. So there is no right number of people to have in an innovation center. I would say with the exception of one, one is not the right person to have there. We have been to innovation and transformation centers that had a, a staff of one or one and a half. I, I personally don't think that's the answer, um, but I also don't think you need to have a, you know, a, a hundred person dedicated staff uh, all the time. It, again, but it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I, would, I would point to Accenture in Bangalore has, you know, what we call nine floors of innovation. Um, and so obviously it's, it's more than one person there on nine floors. Um, but, but the way they've structured that particular center, it's designed to be more than just innovation and transformation. Um, it's also a, a lot about delivery. It's also a lot about partnering um, with, with SAP and Oracle and other technology partners. So how you staff an innovation center is going to have a lot to do with what you're actually trying to do with it. Um, so Kelly and, and John, I don't know if you had any other points you want to make here as we close out with the last two minutes. Any, any last thoughts, Kelly? Hi, sure. Um, just like thinking, um, I think it'll be very interesting to watch the type of talent. Um, I think the question <clears throat> that Patrick had answered um, a few minutes ago is a very, <clears throat> excuse me, good way to look at it. Because I think um, BCG is a good example, I think, um, when I think about the talent piece of it, where they, um, they ran into some challenges when they initially started with bringing the subsidiaries, um, the technology subsidiaries, into some of these engagements. So I think... Um, Watching the talent evolution will be very interesting, and it'll really dictate some of these vendors' success. Because as BCG trained some of its um, employees around the technology elements, um, it kind of helps them to work better and more effectively work with their clients. I don't think they ever really experienced challenges with their clients um, based on a rift around technology, but just understanding it better and kind of having that blend of technology and the consulting side. So having to understand both sides of it and either be specialized around either AI or um, cloud, digital, specialized around one of them, I think um, it makes a big difference for them. And they're able to better uh, communicate their portfolio and better use that network of resources that they have. Oh, just a thought there. That's, that's excellent. And um, so, John Kroll, you get the last word. Well, just, uh, yeah, I mean, just, oh, sorry. Okay, so, yeah, one, I mean, going back to the career models question, um, just reminded me of something we heard from a peer about, you know, uh, a, a digital 
track for, for consultants to sort of get exposure outside of traditional tr strategy. Um, and, and I'm not necessarily saying this is a good, a good uh, track or, or, or way to approach it, but it is, it, it kind of ties back to what Patrick was saying. It doesn't really depend on, on the intention of the Innovation Center and also the firm that's, that's doing it. Maybe this would work for uh, a, a firm that's trying to get more into that space. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And again, if you have any other questions, uh, shoot them to us. You can see who we are there. Um, and we have tons of special reports that you can easily download off our website uh, covering a lot of this different material. Thank you all for joining, and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar.